than Mean Joe Green. I mean, that name just flows. And I ask kids about that, and I say, Mean? And they say, Joe Green. He asked me one time, he said, Andy, why do they call me Mean? And I said, because you're mean. <laughs> just remember Joe has, has been a good football player and not really mean. You're going to be a football player when you go Today is the best day of your life. Believe it. He might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. He can use a day like this. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. Rest of your life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. My favorites. Don't close your eyes when I'm taking a picture of you. There you go. Oh, great. Cheese. <laughs> That's pretty. He is a husband, a father of three, and a grandfather of seven. What's that you got in your lips, girl? We love family. Right. So when we have family time, it's all about family. Thanks, sweetie. <laughs> when we're at home, it's never Mean Joe Green. It's Dad and Papa Joe. Yeah. When we went to uh, North Texas and you saw me interacting with the people, and you were surprised. A little bit. Why? <laughs> um, I guess just because we know you as grandpa, and then all these people are trying to talk to you and coming yeah. up to you, so okay. it's a little new. Yeah, <laughs> these two, they had the same reaction. You didn't know. Like, whoa. <laughs> The man known to his family as Papa Joe was known to the world as Mean Joe. Long before he was a beloved grandfather, he was one of the most feared defenders in NFL history. In 13 seasons as a defensive tackle with the Pittsburgh Steelers, Joe Green was a 10-time Pro Bowler, a two-time Defensive Player of the Year, and a four-time World Champion. He became an NFL icon and a first ballot Hall of Famer. Any special play that you remember that he made or game that you remember like, wow, that's pretty cool? Um, when he, when he fought the Eagles lineman. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was, uh, he was a little bit of a scary guy, to be perfectly honest with you. Not the friendliest type of guy on first impression or first meeting him. I first met Joe on an aircraft carrier. It was at the Senior Bowl. He was playing for the South Senior Bowl team. I was playing for the North. I just remember walking out on the deck of this aircraft carrier, and there were airplanes, and there was Joe Green. And they were both impressive. It was just sort of a presence that was there and still is today. Growing up in Hawaii when I was a kid, and I started paying attention to football, it was guys like the Steel Curtain and Mean Joe Green, who is here. Where's Mean Joe? There he is right there. Those were the guys that were playing, and so I became a Steelers fan. Green was part of arguably football's greatest dynasty. The Steelers of the 70s featured nine Hall of Fame players. Throughout the decades, one of football's most storied franchises has produced a long list of all-time great players. Yet to this day, there is one Steeler that stands above all others. There is nobody else out there that I would put ahead of Joe Green. By far the best Steeler of all time. Joe was the guy. And it was an honor and a privilege, you know, to play with the greatest Steeler of all time to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Dan Rooney. When the Steelers owner was inducted into the Hall of Fame, he chose Joe Green as his presenter. Because he was special. He did signify this team. 
He meant everything. Well, the way he performed, one, the way he carried himself on and off the field. He was it. He was the guy. We just wanted to uh, make an announcement that uh, this season we are going to uh, officially retire Joe Green's number 75. I think Joe is the obvious person from the 70s team to go first in terms of having this number retired. Joe stands as the beginning of reform and change for a football team and for a city. When Joe came, the Steelers were bad. They, they didn't look like they were going to get better. But Joe had that blue-collar work ethic. And he was the cornerstone of the defense. And so when the Steelers won their first Super Bowl, in the four Super Bowls we won in six years, I think Joe stands out as that foundation, the pillar that was the beginning of all of that. And so it's easy to see why they would select Joe as, as the all-time greatest Steeler. <laughs> Is the greatest Steeler more mean Joe? Golly. Or Papa Joe? That's... Snapshots of his life reveal the true picture. When I was a senior in high school, my class voted me to be class president. And I declined. I think about that a lot. And it was basically because I was shy and didn't want to have to talk in front of the class or the student body. <laughs> it's amazing what, what time does. He was raised by his mother in the small town of Temple, Texas. My given name is Charles Edward Green. What I was told uh, about my nickname, Joe, how I got it, uh, was from my auntie. And Born in 46, that was during the reign of Joe Lewis as heavyweight champion, and she thought I was hefty and bulky enough to be called Joe Lewis, and she started calling me Joe, and it kind of stuck. I was the big kid, and the amazing thing is that I recall these days when I used to leave school, I hit the door running, because there was always some kid older than me but wasn't as large as me, wanting to get a reputation by beating me up. That happened a lot in, in the early years, uh, eighth, ninth grade. He could get as much bullet and pick that as the rest of us. This guy's name was Speedy. He was about two, three years older than me, and he was, he had, he was a good-sized guy. And when Speedy got bored, he'd go look for Joe, and he'd beat up Joe. <laughs> Speedy was a... a Bully, he was not a small guy himself. And he kept messing with him and messing with him and messing with him. My mom had given me $5 for my insurance for the football team. And Speedy took the $5. And I said, Speedy, hey, you took my $5. Well, yeah, I did. What you gonna do about it? Whew. It was on. It, it was over. And he caught him, and he was down. He was down between the bleachers, and Joe whooped him something. Never had a problem out of speedy no more. After that day, I didn't have to run anymore from from these kids that wanted to beat me up. You know, because of all the, that had happened in the past, I was playing catch up. I, I was beating up everybody that I could. You know, I owe you. And I started playing football, and. Football, I don't know, I guess it gave me a better sense of worth of who I was as a, as a, as a kid, as a person. It was very aggressive. I remember one time we was playing this team, and they had this real good running back, and Joe hit him and drove him into the light post and busted the lights out of the light post. <laughs> I thought they were going to arrest Joe. He could go off. 
You know, he played mean. He was known for doing you. The thing that enraged me most was when we were losing. And I think that was it. The losing and the, the way I grew up, having, having to fight. So, in a nutshell, it was, I, I wasn't really playing football, I was fighting. Green moved on to North Texas State University, where the hot-headed player made a cool first impression on a fellow student. I was a freshman, he was a sophomore, and he came into the uh, cafeteria and he was laughing, and I saw him laughing and I said, mm, that's the man I'm gonna marry. <laughs> so I fell in love with him at first sight. So I asked around to see who he was dating, and then one of his homegirls introduced us. They said, oh, Joe is a really nice guy, but he's mean. Joe's a nice guy, but he's mean. <laughs> I didn't ask them, but I wondered, how could a person be a very nice guy, but be so mean? He was one of the nicest people I had ever met. In fact, he was probably the nicest guy I had met. He was actually really mean, you know. <laughs> I could kind of motivate him a little bit, you know, for his playing, you know, because if I was back playing strong safety and I, I talk, get back to the hull, I said, oh, boy, I'm, I'm making too many tackles back here, you know. He said, well, they double team me, whatever. I said, I don't care. <laughs> and then he would just go to work. He'd start beating up people. <laughs> He did have the physical attributes to do whatever he wanted to do out there on the field. Just a matter of pushing that right button. My first ball game as a varsity player, which was we played University of Texas at El Paso here, and we just had a great game defensively. That's when they started the Mean Green chant. They started chanting, Mean Green, you look so good to me. Before Joe set foot on his college field, the North Texas sports teams were nicknamed the Eagles, but the dominant defense he was part of inspired a name change. And ever since the late 60s, the school's teams have been known as the Mean Green. At the same time Green was making a big impression on campus, tales of his North Texas heroics were making their way across the country. I remember I, I saw all the films and heard all the reports, you know, you know the Superman. And I was flying back from the West Coast with my wife, and I got off the plane, and left my wife on the plane. I said, you can come with me, but I have to go see this guy alive. The early third down, you know, he would just completely destroy everybody around him. He had the athletic ability and the temperament. You know, he had it all. The shy kid, who had grown into a legend on the fields of Texas, was about to change the image of a franchise and the city. I know I'm in the way. I'm going to get this microphone in face. In the way, my head. Okay. Next selection, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steelers first round selection, Joe Green, G-R-E-E-N-E. Defensive tackle, North Texas State. I was depressed. I was just depressed. I, I did not want to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. Because I knew of the record. In 36 years of existence, the Pittsburgh Steelers had played in just one playoff game and lost it. Entering 1969, there was a new head coach in charge who had just bet the house on a kid from Texas who was anything but a household name. The day after the draft, the headlines in the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Joe who with a question mark. Yeah. If you understand the context of the time, People expected that the Steelers probably drafted another no-name who was no good. 
I'd never heard of, of Joe Green. I, I did, I'd never actually heard of North Texas State. I was just kind of shocked that, oh, here we go, another high draft choice that's not going to work out. After a brief holdout, Green reported to camp, where skeptical veterans waited to test the rookie's mettle. They were trying to kill me. Ray Mansfield was uh, the Steelers' setter, a really tough guy. Ray said, I'm going to show this rookie what the NFL is all about. Ray fired out. Joe took him and just, he just threw him up in the air. I mean, he was just gone. And they crushed the, the running back. And, and we were all like, oh my God, did you see that? We were huge fans, all of that fast. Joe Green, the defensive rookie of the year. To the Steelers, he's the dawn of a new era. You know, you go back to the early films, he was so much better than a lot of the guys here. He was so much better. It seemed like he was a man on an island. Despite Green's heroics, Pittsburgh went 1-13 his rookie year, the first of three consecutive losing seasons. Those years were some tough years. We were miserable. We were terrible. After some of the losses we had, man, he wasn't the most controllable person. We're playing in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia has the ball. And if they can make a first time, the game's over. They made it. They made the first time. And he went up, took the football, and threw it in the stands. And I said to my father, this guy's special. If he's that intense, if he's going to do something like that, we got a guy that we want. Hey, Cleveland, how you like us now? He didn't like the name Mean Joe Green, as we well know. It just it was a moniker that was placed upon him. Nice payback. Nice. But he kind of lived up to it. And there was a kind of a fear factor. You just did not get on the wrong side of Joe. Some people ask that question, what does Joe really mean? Yeah, that was the perfect name for him. He hated to lose. That was part of his demeanor. He's here to win. He's here to beat that guy across from him. And he's not going to be nice about it. Green's ire was not confined solely to his opponents. I used to raise heck with those officials. I had a tendency to bristle at authority for whatever reason. It was always a source of irritation and anger when you got held, because I thought it was cheating. People had to hold Joe. Well, uh, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, and that's the way Joe felt. Joe would give you a warning if he thought you were doing something wrong. And if you didn't take his warning, then Joe would become a vigilante. Deserve it of the name Mean Joe Green while he played football. You got to remember too that was a different era. It would have been very interesting to see how Joe would have reacted to cable TV and and talk radio today. Defense. Joe could get very emotional. And when Joe got emotional, you had to stand back a little bit. They're going to hit Joe Green with another quick 15. Boy, there's a fast 30 yards. So where did all this dirt go that you kicked? <laughs> I mean, you usually have to... Baseball players do it all the time. I saw, uh, yeah, what's this guy, uh, manager? Earl, we, we pile up dirt on the <laughs> on home plate. I, it was unintentional. It, it was just a reaction. And when I look back and I think about it, it was being disruptive and belligerent. I don't know how many other teams would have tolerated my antics. If any other player had acted that way, except for Joe Green, Coach Noel would have cut him. But Joe Green, he could see that this is a guy that can turn things around. In 1972 and 73, the Steelers made the playoffs, only to fall short of the Super Bowl both times. 
I reached, well, I'll call it a breaking point in 74. That's when I thought it's not going to happen here. Green's frustration boiled over after a late season loss to the Oilers. The offense didn't do a thing that day. First day we came back to practice. I went to my locker, took out what I thought was necessary, and I was leaving. I was surprised. I was, I must admit that. And uh, thought, you know, Joe's letting his uh, emotions get in the way. I was quitting. Quitting, how about that? That's a bad word, quit. But that's what I was doing. And as I was taking those steps, I was saying, somebody, please stop me. Lionel Taylor, our receiver coach, he said, hold up a minute. He sat down in the car and we talked. I don't know what we talked about. But anyway, I was glad we talked. That's how I went back. And that's when it started. Six weeks after nearly quitting the team, Green led Pittsburgh to its first Super Bowl. The Steelers' defense would hold the Vikings' offense scoreless and allow just 17 yards rushing. Walking amongst the guys, my head was this big. You know, it felt that way. To be a Steeler and wear the black and gold, yeah, it was special. And I think the journey is what made it so sweet. All the 13 losses and the 1 in 13 was in my head, and the Pittsburgh Steelers, SOS, same old Steelers, and golly, all of that stuff. That's what made that one so special, because it was the first, and it brought Pittsburgh into the picture of football teams in the National Football League that, okay, you got to deal with us now. Let's go, Joe. Let's go, Chief, baby. Pittsburgh capped its 1975 season by winning a second straight championship in Super Bowl X. The Steelers' defense was becoming the stuff of legend, especially the front four, a unit comprised of Joe Green, Dwight White, Ernie Holmes, and L.C. Greenwood. I really, really enjoyed being a part of that group. L.C., we came in together. Ernie, he was mean. Yeah, Ernie was mean. And Dwight, mad dog. Dwight would talk the entire ball game. Sack pack is a sack of you know what. <laughs> I'd say sometimes, Dwight, shut up. Will you shut up? Joe's the most serious one of the bunch. You know, they all were different in their ways, but by the time they got to be the still Kurt, they all looked up to Joe. Arguably, he was probably the best defensive tackle ever play the game. His hands were gigantic. They used to tell the guys, don't put lazy hands on the guy. You want to put crushing hands, bruising hands. When you touch him, you want him to feel it. When you punch, you're trying to punch all the way through his body. And then the quickness of your hands. We were sitting at a bar, and there was a tip there. And he'd say, let's move our hands. See, how fast can you move your hand? And I think I have pretty quick hands. He, he could do it faster. Weren't they normal? A little bigger than average. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I mean, Joe was a big man. And Joe was extraordinarily strong before the world of weightlifting and nutrition. Joe was was a big weightlifter, but he was tremendous natural strength. You got people out there wearing numbers today, they're, they're not athletes, they're big. Well, they're bigger. 
But they don't have people faster or stronger in football strength than Joe was. He was probably, for five yards, the fastest guy on the team. I mean, he was explosive off the ball. He would crowd the ball, and he was quick off the ball. He's one of the first people that came in and could explode off the ball. I like to think that I played with rocket fuel as opposed to diesel. Diesel is powerful, but slow and methodical. Rocket fuel is explosive. It's fast, it's quick. In layman terms, get after it. Relentlessness. Refusing to be denied. Nothing ever stops the forward movement. You just still come in. Is that JB? Let me see that again. As a kid, Green had declined to be class president because of shyness. But by the mid 70s, he had accepted his role as team leader. Look at, look at his foot coming in. <laughs> That's true. He wicked, man. I was able to, uh, to grow up. I was able to grow up. I really think one of the key moments was when Chuck made me a captain. I couldn't be uh, the guy that I was before, arguing with officials, arguing with other players. That was a distraction to my own guys. And I didn't realize that until when I was a captain, I had to be more responsible. And I saw the effects of my bad behavior in, in, a, in a different light. It was very powerful, the way he looked at it. It wasn't just, OK, we've got to name three guys. We'll name him, him, and him. It was something special to Joe. Oh, I got to get some, driving him back home? Yeah, you got to get some depth straight over. I think I started to take the game a bit more serious. You need to do more than just go out on the field on game day and play. And you still just stay in there with what you ought to do because he's giving off so much just to come down and rub it. Right. People quote about leaders and all of this kind of rhetoric until you meet Joe Green. You look up to that guy and you don't want to let him down. With Joe Green, I found that leadership really does matter. Perhaps nothing exemplified Green's team first spirit better than a formation he helped create, the Stunt 4-3. He saw that between the center and the guard, there was a large gap. He jumped in the gap between the guard center, tilted his body, he turned his shoulders like this, and then he exploded through that hole. It wasn't a design defense that a coach came up with and said, hey, this is what we're gonna do. It was something that Joe saw. All right, we got the stunt 4-3. We got the stunt man on the weak side. That stunt 4-3 is a brutal thing on the nose. You are going to create double team. You are going to force that offensive line to have two guys block you. Joe Green realized that I'm gonna be double teamed every time here, all right? I may not make the big, crazy plays, sensational plays, but if we're going to win the championship, I've got to do this. There's the safety. L.C. Greenwood back in. If the best player on your team cares this much about winning and not about all pro, well, we all fall into place like lemmings. Up next. Doing the Coca-Cola spot did change the image. I enjoyed it. I liked it. It made me more approachable. Joe Green and the Steelers celebrated two more Super Bowl championships as the NFL's dominant team of the decade. It was the kind of success that earned Joe a number of roles in 1970s action movies as Hollywood cashed in on his tough guy image. I just saw portions of the Black Six recently, and one of the guys, he put it on the big screen up there. And we, and we, had, a, we had a good time laughing at it. 
Lady Coco, I was a sniper. I was supposed to kill Lola Falana, but I never said a word. It wasn't much to see in uh, Smokey. Get out of there, you son of a bitch! Or you gonna have a penalty flag hanging out of your ass! And that's been tried before. But your possibility for success is extremely remote. <laughs> They're forgettable, aren't they? The human nature is that you want to see yourself in a good light. And I didn't think that was a good light. Green's rugged public persona and life changed dramatically after being selected for a television commercial by Madison Avenue creative wizard, Penny Hawkey. We were asked to do an exploratory, that is to take the Coca-Cola brand and see where else it could go in its communications. The guys were sitting there saying, okay, well, who could we get? Well, we could get Lynn Swan, Terry Bradshaw, Franco Harris, Mean Joe Green. And I said, wait, there's a guy called Mean Joe Green? Is he mean? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, that's perfect. We want the most intimidating human being we can find. And boy, did we get it. In the commercial, Mean Joe would have a memorable encounter with a trembling nine-year-old, played by a kid from a showbiz family. My mom and my dad were both in television. As to our future weather, well, we expect the rain to... My mom was on-air talent. My dad was a director and a producer. I had started doing commercials probably when I was around five or so. So by the time we did the co-commercial, I had probably done about 30 or 40 commercials up to that point. Let's go. Keep your hands up. I think you fumbled. On the first day when we shot the commercial, there was a lot of downtime because they were doing a lot of work to the set. And uh, because of that, there wasn't a lot to do. So, of course, I had brought a football and went over to Joe and asked if he'd throw a football around. And he said, sure. He developed a sweet little relationship with Tommy and made Tommy much more comfortable. Okay. Now, I... giving the line, Joe. Okay. <laughs> they were trying to get him to drink the whole Coke. And they had him maybe do that a couple of times and just said they were gonna, the guy was going to blow up after a while. He went through an awful lot of soda. And you know the, the legend, of course, that he drank 18 16-ounce bottles, equivalent to two and a quarter gallons. <laughs> Needless to say, when I started to shoot, First thing out of my mouth was a big burp. <laughs> hey, kid. All right, cut. <laughs> Talk about absolutely perfect timing. Super Bowl programs. Super Bowl souvenirs. Super Bowl pennants. Super the commercial Bowl. ran on the Super Bowl, and then they won. And the rest is history. What could be better? Mr. Green? Mr. Green? Yeah. Want my Coke? It's okay, you can have it. Okay. A Coke Thanks. and a smile Makes me feel good Makes me feel nice Be around That's the way it should be And I like to see The whole world is smiling Joe Green was probably the first black male that was cast in an, for a national brand. It was the fact that he was black and the little boy was white. It was a shock at that time, and people experienced it and really resonated to it. I don't know where that jersey went. I don't know if Joe took it back or who got it. I do know that that Christmas I got a package, and uh, it was a signed... Mean Joe Green jersey that I uh, still have to this day. Joe and Tom have kept in touch ever since. But he was not the only child whose life would be positively influenced by Joe Green. I think uh, it changed our lives a lot. It changed Joe's personality a lot. Because so many kids were looking up to him, he decided he really wanted to be a role model for the kids. I think Mean Joe Green should be 
be called Sweet Joe Green. Because he always smiled and it looked sweet. And it really was nice. He appeared with the Muppets and probably Elmo and was on children's TV shows. Well, you know, I used to be afraid of my own shadow. And then everybody told me that was silly. What are you afraid of? Well, lots of things. Like the whole offensive line of the Rams jumping on me. Yeah? We'd be walking around and little old ladies that I know didn't know anything about football would come up to Joe and talk to him. Listen, you're not a mean guy. He's just a big old teddy bear. Doing the Coca-Cola spot did change the image. I enjoyed it, I liked it. It made me uh, more approachable. To this day, I'm still rather amazed. I mean, it's the commercial that will not die. Me, Mr. Green? Please. Mr. Green? Yeah? Want my Downy Unstoppables? Laundry smells good for a long time. OK. See you around. Hey, kid. Catch. Wow. No thanks, me, Joe. Last time I'm doing this. <laughs> Coming up. Someone would say, me and Joe Green. I said, no, he's gone. That guy that played ball has been gone a long time. After his Coke commercial, Mean Joe Green didn't seem so mean anymore. He was much less intimidating not only off the field, but on it. Actually, Green hadn't been at full strength for years, playing with nerve damage in his arm and shoulder. When I found out that I had a problem it was middle of 75 season. In the shower and I had a towel that I was rubbing myself down with. Couldn't pick it up. And then I looked. Ooh, my arm was. <laughs> and it's still that way. I lost a lot of strength in it because of the nerve. Green has not penetrated very much today. I don't think he's really got the quickness that really is Joe Green. Green's injury became apparent during the 1975 AFC Championship game. Coming across the middle of the field, I'm knocked out. Joe, who's hurt, had a pinched nerve, comes off the bench in that cape, and he grabs me, and he's trying to pick me up and carry me off the field. It was spontaneous, because if I had thought about it, I probably wouldn't have done it. Because as I picked him up, I almost dropped him, because of, I couldn't hold him, my left arm. I lost some juice. I wasn't as spry as I was before. <laughs> Green played nearly half of his career with a weakened left arm. Yet he performed well enough that four of his 10 Pro Bowl seasons came when he was at less than full strength. By 1981, however, Green could no longer hide the weakness in his arm or his game. It was humbling, yes. And he ended up getting banged up and turned into a mere mortal. When I thought anything but that. I came here as a boy. I'm going to leave here as a man. I, I tend to think of this time as being a graduation. Mr. Rooney, Dan, and Chuck and his staff, they allowed a country boy from Texas to come up here and, and be himself. Uh, say the things and do the things that, that came natural to him, whether they were good or bad. The negative, as it is with the positive, w was a part of my growing up, a part of the maturing of Joe Green. And I, I worked very hard for 13 years. And it's, it, it is time for me to do something else. Good luck, I, I, I know you. I know you're having fun. Are, are you happy with your coaching? I'm, I'm having fun. I like to get him a little bit better, but I'm having fun. But you like coaching? Yeah. Green spent 17 seasons as a defensive line coach in Pittsburgh, Miami, and Arizona. Right here, you let that guy get all the way down there. In 2004, the greatest Steeler returned to Pittsburgh yet again.
to tackle another new position in scouting and player personnel. He was somebody that we felt understood what kind of player we wanted to have on the Pittsburgh Steelers. In regards to Joe's expertise on leadership, we really leaned on that in our scouting sessions. He could tell us things that we didn't know, and he could see leadership in people that we may not have been able to see because he was that leader, so he could see those types of qualities in other players. I really believe that Joe's influence on the organization, it was felt. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that we got back in our winning ways when Joe joined us. During Green's nine seasons in the front office, the Steelers added two more Lombardi trophies to their collection. Green is the only former Steelers player to have a hand in all six of the team's Super Bowl titles. In 2013, Green once again retired from the game. And while he is learning to live life without football, over the past few years, he has had to deal with much more difficult losses. Former Pittsburgh Steelers defensive lineman Ernie Holmes died late Thursday night in a car accident in Lumberton, Texas. One of the original members of the Pittsburgh Steelers steel curtain defense, Dwight White, has died due to complications from back surgery. He was 58 years old. Legend L.C. Greenwood has died at the age of 67. Greenwood died at UPMC Oakland while recuperating from back surgery. Dwight, Ernie, and L.C. and I, we established a pretty good bond. You know, L.C. and I came in together, though, as I stated, but, uh, oh, boy. <laughs> I'll keep them alive. I'll keep them alive with the memories. But yeah, I miss them. I miss them. I miss them a lot. I miss them a lot. In June of 2014, Green said goodbye to another good friend, his Hall of Fame coach, Chuck Knoll. Mrs. Knoll, when she talked about Paul Bears, Joe was the first name that came up. There, there was no question. And Joe was a little reluctant because he didn't want to be the guy who took Chuck on his last journey. But obviously, he deferred to Mary Ann's wishes. And, uh, did what he had to do, which uh, was the story of Joe Green's career. He do what he had to do. When they think of me as a football player, I would like for people to think that I put it on the line every time, good or bad. Win or lose, put it on the line. The world knows him as Mean Joe. His family as Papa Joe. The truth is, the real Joe Green is every bit of both. You know, someone would say, Mean Joe Green. I said, no, he's gone. That guy that played ball has been gone a long time. And I appreciate it, for no doubt. That's a part of who I have been. Maybe something that who I still am, I don't know. I actually say he's not very mean, he's like a big teddy bear, because that's the way I see you. I know, see, I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way I see you sometimes. I wouldn't say that, you know, you should approach him as a teddy bear, maybe like a brown bear. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. Is it safe to say that Joe Green is alive and well, but mean Joe Green's gone? No, it's yeah. not safe to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you still got to say that. That's far-fetched. 